All right, good evening, everyone. We begin the readout tonight with explosive news from the investigation into January 6th. In a bold and necessary move today, the House Select Committee requested testimony from a second House Republican, Congressman Jim Jordan of Ohio. It's a sign that even sitting members of Congress cannot evade scrutiny for their role in Trump's attempted coup. And for Jordan, that scrutiny is long overdue. In a letter today, the committee expressed interest in Jordan's phone calls with Donald Trump on January 6th, saying, we would like to discuss each such communication with you in detail. Of course, Jordan has been almost comically evasive on the details of those calls. Here's a look back at some of his explanations. Did you talk to the former president that day? I've talked to the former president umpteen times, thousands, I mean, I may not thousands, I mean, on times, January but countless, 6th. countless times. I continue to talk to the president no, no, since no, he's I mean left on office. January 6th, Congressman. Yes. On January 6th, did you speak with him before, during, or after the Capitol was attacked? Uh, I'd have to go, I, 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 I spoke with him that day after, I think after. I don't know if I spoke with him in the morning or not. I, I, I just don't know. I talked to him that day. I, I, my understanding is, from my memory, I talked to him after the attack happened and we were moved to the, to the chamber. I may have talked to him before. I don't know. So hard to remember. Like, such an unmemorable day. In requesting his cooperation, the committee also cites Jordan's own words. On multiple occasions, he has indicated that he would indeed testify if called upon by the committee, saying, I've got nothing to hide. Well, it's time for him to prove it. As we've seen in recent reporting, many who openly mock the select committee were the same people who were actively plotting with the Trump White House to usurp Joe Biden's presidency. They amplified the big lie. They interfered with the Justice Department and they pressured state legislatures. And they can't seem to get their stories together either. For instance, January 6th organizer Ali Alexander has testified to the select committee that he did indeed communicate with three House Republicans before the siege. According to a court filing, he said he'd had a few phone conversations with Congressman Paul Gosar, a text exchange with Congressman Mo Brooks, and he said he spoke to Congressman Andy Biggs in person. And in confirming those communications, Alexander has now contradicted the denials of those Republican lawmakers. That is why we need accountability and fast. After all, the United States has already been flagged as a declining democracy, and many of our elected representatives share in the blame. As three retired generals pointed out in a Washington Post op-ed on Friday, not a single leader who inspired the insurrection has been held to account. Our elected officials and those who enforce the law, including the Justice Department, the House Select Committee, and the whole of Congress must show more urgency. And joining me now is one of the authors of that op-ed, retired Army Brigadier General Stephen Anderson, also Stuart Stevens, senior advisor for the Lincoln Project, and Glenn Kirshner, former federal prosecutor and an MSNBC legal analyst. Uh, Brigadier General Anderson, thank you so much for being here. I was eager to speak with you. I read your op-ed that you wrote with two other retired generals in absolute terror, to be honest with you. It scared the hell out of me. Um, the idea that not only do we have to worry about the people who plotted the first coup launching another, which I firmly believe they will. I think most of the people on this panel, if, all, if not all, firmly believe they will try. But that we can't necessarily count on the military to hold the line. That scares me. Um, because it means that we have a breakdown internally in one of the most important and trusted institutions in the country. So walk me through what we need to be afraid of. I know there were a lot of people with military credentials. I think it was like one in 10 initially who were you know, charged with crimes or accused of crimes on that day, had military backgrounds. A lot of military people were there. But what, what, what is your biggest fear when it comes to whether the military itself will hold the line when they try this again? Well, our, our, <clears throat> thank you very much, Joy, for having me. And it's an honor to be a part of this. Um, First of all, I want to make it understood that, uh, you know, I'm 31 years in the Army. I'm, I've always been taught to be apolitical, to not be involved in politics. And in fact, I always voted Republican up until 2016. Uh, but the party has absolutely lost its soul. It's forgotten its ideology. And Jim Jordan is the actual poster child for, for that happening. He and the leaders like him in the Republican Party are why we wrote the op-ed that we did. 43 years ago, mm -hmm. I swore an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And 
Little did I know that 43 years later, we'd have the kind of domestic threats that we have right now. And again, Jim Jordan is why. I mean, but you look at some of the other things out there that make us chill to our bones. I mean, as you mentioned, uh, over 100 military people participated in the actual insurrection. That's pretty scary. Then you got guys like Lieutenant General Mike Flynn, uh, former NSA, mm -hmm. who's advocating using the military to conduct a coup. I mean, are you kidding me? That's disgraceful. You have 124 senior leaders that signed a letter supporting Trump's big lie. I mean, evidently, the authoritative source for electric, uh, election integrity with those people is the pillow guy. You have a general officer out in Oklahoma who's refusing federal mandates. The, you know, please remind him that he works for the National Guard. And then you got all these soldiers that are refusing the COVID vaccine. I mean, every soldier has to take about 12 inoculations to even get through basic training. But we've so politicized things like COVID by the likes of Jim Jordan. Uh, and, then, and, then, and then, of course, you got Fox News adding fuel to the fire. And the Republican Party that has spent now 11 months since the 6th of, of, of January uh, essentially regarding the insurrection as a, a tour that got out of hand. I'm definitely afraid for our troops. I'm definitely afraid for our democracy. Uh, our troops will, con will, unfortunately, with people like Jim Jordan, they will confuse allegiance to the Constitution, which they swore an oath to uphold and defend, allegiance to the Constitution versus allegiance to a party, a person like a Jim Jordan or a Donald Trump. We love democracy, and that's why we're concerned. Yeah, I, and, and, and I share your concerns, but hearing it come from you all, honestly, made me even more afraid, to be honest with you. you this is part of what the op-ed said. It said, we're chilled to our bones at the thought of a coup succeeding, succeeding next time. The potential for a total breakdown in the chain of command among partisan lines from the top of the chain to squad level is significant should another insurrection occur. And, and here's, and I'm going to say with you just for, for one more moment, there are people in the military now who quietly supported what happened on January 6th and wished that it had succeeded. And I don't know who all of those people are. We do know that Michael Flynn, who used to be a very decorated member of the United States military, very respected, and then went wrong somewhere. Something went haywire. Now he's like more QAnon than he is military. His brother still has a position of authority inside of the United States military. Michael Flynn, the former general, requested a restraining order to stop the January 6th committee from getting his documents. The judge said, no, there's no basis for that. But Charles Flynn, um, Brigadier General Anderson, is still in place. The Army first falsely denied that Charles Flynn was involved in the response to the insurrection. Then Flynn denied that he ever opposed sending the National Guard to quell the violence. But now Flynn has been accused of lying to Congress about his role in delaying the response that day. It scares me that people like he are still in place and that they might be on the wrong side. Does it scare you? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we recommended is that we gather intelligence against people within our ranks, people like uh, Michael Flynn's brother, Charles. You know, um, I, I don't know the man. I served with his brother, though, in Iraq, and he was fine over there. But it, obviously, he's lost his mind since then. Um, but, I, I, you know, we've got to know who within us is going to be a potential mutineer. Um, and, and the thing that we need to do is find those people and get them out of the Army. We need to remind them all that serving in the military is a privilege. It is not an inalienable right, okay? And, and so to be a part of a, an extremist group or any kind of a hate group or, or, or Oath Keepers or, or any of those Proud Boy organizations, something like that, you can't be a member of that group and still be a member of the Army. And we need to make sure that we conduct the intelligence to find those people and root them out. Stuart, let me go to you on this, because we did have a Proud Boy plead guilty today, and this is a member, his name is Matthew Green, remember the Proud Boys pleaded guilty today of obstructing Congress. Some of them are flipping, right? Some of them are, are, are telling about the conspiracy. But there are, you know, the group, the Oath Keepers, is made up of military and police. So there are a lot of armed, heavily trained people who are falling into this cult, Stuart, on the right. And I don't really know what we do about that. Do you have ideas? Well, look, I think the, the greatest danger here is that the Republican Party has shown that it will not stand up to this, that it will actually go along with it. I mean, that's the extraordinary thing to me, not that there are a group of people who tried to 
you know, crashed the Capitol, attacked the Capitol, you could say, OK, maybe that's just a smallish group. But the Republican Party, one of the two major parties, the United States of America, the world's only superpower, has made it clear that if this was successful, there's no reason to believe that they would oppose it. And I, I don't yeah. know if you're in your office, you're running for your life, and you still won't hold those people accountable. You still won't vote to uh, convict Donald Trump, who they all say was behind it, or most of them say, Mitch McConnell says, but he still won't do it. So I, I, I think that's just like a classic testing of a system. And I, I don't believe the system uh, succeeded because I think the Republican Party continues to fail.